In this video, I want to explain the very interesting concept of vector spaces and how a vector can be used to represent a function. So on the left-hand side there, I've got a continuous function. Um, in this example, I'm going to be using a, a cross-section of a brain used uh, to simulate a medical imaging scan. And so this is a continuous function, f of x, y, where we've got some value f varying with position x and position y. What we can do is discretize that function, and now we're just going to use um, 50 discrete positions in x, 50 discrete positions in y, so these are now integer values of x and y, and we can have an amplitude corresponding to the value of the pixel in each one of those locations. This is now a discrete 2D function. Now to emphasize a point here, what I'm going to do is discretize that even more, and so I've got 8 pixels here, 8 pixels in the y direction as well, so that's an 8 by 8 grid which gives 64 pixels, and then I've got a value corresponding to the grayscale value in each of those pixels, which I can basically take and stack into a column vector. So if I've got an 8 by 8 grid of pixels, therefore I've got 64 values, and I can stack them into a very tall column vector, which I'll be calling theta. So first of all then, let's shrink it down to considering just two pixels only in that image. So here I've got a value of 75 in that pixel and a value or an amplitude or a coefficient of 20 in that second pixel. So now my vector theta just contains two elements, just those two values, 75 and 20. Therefore, what I can do is consider a two-dimensional vector space where I've got the value of element 1, so theta 1, along this axis. So I need to go along to a position of theta 1 equal to 75 on this axis. And then on the second axis, I've got the second element of theta. So that's element theta 2. And I've got to go to position 20 along that axis. So therefore, when I go to position 75 on axis 1, position 20 on axis 2, that gives me a 2D coordinate in a two-dimensional space. Okay, this is a 2D vector space, and therefore this particular two-pixel image is a single point in that 2D space. And of course, I could have many, infinitely many uh, values for these two pixels, and that would correspond to different positions in this theta1, theta2, two-dimensional vector space. You can see I'm moving my cursor around here. Each position of that, that red uh, cursor would correspond to a unique two pixel image according to the values of theta 1 and theta 2. Okay, so let's build up complexity a bit more. Now uh, imagine I just had three pixels only. So now I'm showing 75, 20, and 25. So I could stack that in a column vector theta. Now it's a three dimensional vector theta with three values. And so now I could consider a 3D space with theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 as the axes, and I just traverse a distance of 75 along axis 1, in other words, the dimension theta 1, a distance of 20 along theta 2, a distance of 25 along theta 3, which will take me to a coordinate in 3D space. So, obviously, I've just drawn uh, this little circle here, but in general, it's going to be somewhere located in a 3D space. And um, the position in the 3D space would correspond to the unique values in that 3-pixel image. So again, we could consider moving the cursor around in a 3-dimensional space, and any particular location in 3D space would correspond to a unique 3-pixel image, because the, the, the coefficients or the amplitudes or the values here would be changing according to the position in that 3D vector space. Okay, so let's build up complexity further. Uh, let's go back to that 50 by 50 case. Um, so we've got 50 pixels by 50 pixels. This is now uh, a 2,500 pixel image. And again, we can uh, list those values in this tall column vector theta. And this is now a vector that exists in a 2,500 dimensional vector space. So this particular brain image here would correspond to one particular location in that 2,500 dimensional vector space. Let's go further again. Now I'll consider a more general image, maybe 10 megapixel image here that we could have taken with a grayscale 
photograph here. This 2D image, um, again, corresponds to just a tall column vector with 10 million values uh, just stacked as elements in that vector. And therefore, this particular photograph is a single point in a, two, in a 10 million dimensional vector space. So that's quite an interesting concept. That means every single 10 megapixel photo ever taken actually exists in a 10 million dimensional vector space. So here I've, I've kept the axes just limited to three here, theta one, theta two, theta three. You should indeed, of course, imagine 10 million such axes um, orthogonal to each other. And then we could consider every single photograph as just existing as a position in that high dimensional vector space. So I've pointed out here a, a subspace or a manifold um, just to say that um, this could represent, for example, every photo of a river ever taken. This photo is a photo of the River Thames. And um, obviously, photos of rivers are never going to fill the entirety of this space. It has to be some kind of subspace because over here, for example, we could have photos of trees. So over here, we've got photos of rivers. And, and what's amazing, of course, is that it considers every possible river at any moment in time, such as the, the vastness of this high dimensional vector space. Of course, we could consider any category that we like. And I'm showing here another subspace just shown in red here, which could correspond to photographs of buildings in particular cities, whatever they are, they all occupy unique separate subspaces of this 10 million dimensional vector space. So quite a powerful concept, I'm sure you would agree. So just to finish, I want to talk about uh, continuous 2D functions to go right back to the beginning where we had this continuous f of x, y function. I just want to point out that that can be regarded as a point in an infinite dimensional vector space. So how would that work? Well, we'd have to start using the continuous Dirac delta function. So if this is a 2D image here, a 2D function, then we'd have to use a two-dimensional Dirac delta function. And I can give you a pointer to a video on Dirac delta functions if you want to understand those better. But the point is this continuous function would just correspond to using amplitudes or coefficients of continuous 2D Dirac delta functions. And of course, because there are infinitely many of those that would describe a function, therefore we now have um, infinitely many amplitudes or coefficients to describe a continuous function, and therefore a continuous function can be considered as a point in an infinite dimensional vector space. So I hope that was helpful. Thanks for listening.